After 32 years of leading Activision Blizzard, CEO Bobby Kotick is officially leaving the gaming company on December 29th as Microsoft's acquisition deal is complete. And though I wish he was gone on less eh, generous terms, we're finally free of one of the main drivers of the microtransaction mess modern gaming has turned into. But while Bobby Kotick was the guy who kicked the industry's lust for money into overdrive, it was really another CEO who had the brilliant idea in the first place. Todd Howard, of Bethesda fame and infamy, brought us the origin of modern gaming's fascination with microtransactions and battle passes. One stupid little item sold for just $2.50. Oblivion's horse armor. Who's laughing now? We'll go over the history of how we got from then to now. We'll cover some spicy news about the future of gaming, and also have some potential solutions for how game dev can survive in an era of mass layoffs without feeling like they're ripping off their customers. Downloadable or purchasable content wasn't always a bad thing, and it still isn't if we're being honest. The 90s and 2000s were full of great expansions for famous games. Brood War for StarCraft, The Frozen Throne for Warcraft 3, and The Conquerors for Age of Empires each took a game that was already fantastic with compelling stories and gameplay and expanded on it, adding units, features, and campaigns which sometimes even outshone their original releases. And that's the short list, not counting my personal favorites like Roller Coaster Tycoon, Command and Conquer Generals, and Majesty. It felt like the 90s and 2000s were full of hit after hit and the $20 I got from my mom for the Scholastic Book Fair to buy a book could actually get a damn good game. Eventually, with the rise of the internet, you were able to download games and DLC online onto your PC or console. Alongside Microsoft's original Xbox, they created the Xbox Live service, and many of their games were available with downloadable content. Pretty much all of it, except for official Microsoft published content, was free. The only caveat being slow download speeds and minuscule storage space. But hey, a couple hours was worth it for new maps in Halo 2 or Splinter Cell. Xbox Live Marketplace changes the way people try and buy games. When Microsoft released the Xbox 360, Microsoft thought that publishers would benefit from offering small downloadable content for tiny prices from $1 to $5 instead of charging the full price for expansion packs. There were still some games that offered free DLC like it had been originally. The original Gears of War had six downloadable maps at no charge. Bungie gave us cold storage and the heroic map pack from Halo 3 for free or at least it was 800 Microsoft points, then became free after it turned out to be wildly unpopular. And who doesn't remember the Veterans Map Pack brought to you by Pontiac from Army of Two? It seemed that DLC was going to be an awesome addition to the future of gaming. But tragedy struck on the fateful day of April 3rd, 2006, and the face of DLC would end up changing forever. Just 27 days after Oblivion's release, Bethesda offered horse armor to download at the low, low price of $2.50. Or rather, it was an abstract 200 Microsoft points. Which is kind of bullshit, because at the time you could only buy Microsoft points in bundles of 400 or more. This ended up being a completely different level of bullshit though. When it was announced, the horse armor DLC was mocked endlessly by fans saying that $2.50 was an outlandish price for something so pointless, especially for content that really should have been released with the game. Paying more for content that should have been released with the game? Hmm, I wonder how far we could stretch this. Even with the outcry being so loud, it ended up being their ninth best selling DLC for Oblivion. Publishers saw green and really just read in between the lines. There wasn't an immediate jump to what we have now. For a while it was mostly cosmetic items, skins for your guns in TF2, a gentlemanly top hat in League of Legends, or new furniture in The Sims. You know, stuff to flex on your friends to lie that you were actually good at the game. But it gradually grew and grew. Mobile gaming really started taking off in the early 2010s with the onslaught of hundreds of millions of new smartphone users. This brand new audience of soccer moms and Facebook teens was much more prone to be victims of predatory monetization. People that didn't know that the rest of us were paying reasonable prices for great games. Through the 2010s, it got worse and worse. Instead of just cosmetic changes to boost your EP, I mean ego, you ended up with pay to win mechanics that printed money for mobile games like Clash of Clans and Candy Crush. Why flex on your friends with waifu skins when you could flex on them by being a better gamer than them with your broken waifu skins? 
You could spend hundreds or even thousands of dollars in MapleStory for increased item stats. Dead Space 3 was made to be grindy with a paid option to make it somewhat fun. Battlefront 2 had paid loot boxes that gave better items, just to name a few. You'd read about another controversy every month, but despite fan backlash, it never really got any better. There'd be backlash to the last controversy, the game posts record profits, and then the next game puts in some even worse monetization scheme. Rinse and repeat. Fire Emblem Heroes, the free-to-play smartphone gacha game, has made more money than the other 15 Fire Emblem games combined. Pirate Software said a single mount in World of Warcraft made more than all of StarCraft II Wings of Liberty. Turns out, companies don't really care that much about downvotes and angry tweets when there's so much more money coming in than before. Gaming is a massive industry now, approaching 10 times the size of the worldwide movie industry. And that just covers the outlandish price part of our sentence. What about the second half, content that should have been released with the game? There's been huge crunch issues in game development for ages. Game developers putting in 80 hour weeks for months on end to barely hit a deadline, trying to seal up the buggy cracks last minute with as many hacks as they could. In the 90s and 2000s, if you released a buggy, incomplete game, you were stuck with it. It got awful reviews, bombed, and people never heard of it again. These are major players, man. The Russians, the Chinese, hell, even the French want this thing. Now, publishers could force early releases from their studios and get the devs to keep working on it for the last few months until the official release, pushing out day one patches to Frankenstein the whole contraption together. Despite the hundreds of people working on them, the only part that seemed to be completely functional on release was the microtransactions. It can don't worry, that part always works flawlessly and never needs a day one patch. And if it did, you bet your ass it would be hotfixed in less than 24 hours. Mass Effect Andromeda, Assassin's Creed Unity, SimCity 2013, and of course the dynamic duo, Cyberpunk 2077 and No Man's Sky were launched full of bugs, missing features, and empty promises. Yes, you can fix issues after release, and props to both of these studios for putting their heads down and grinding out a proper game. But for every Cyberpunk and No Man's Sky, there's three Mass Effect Andromedas that halt future development and story DLC, leaving a buggy, incomplete mess. As much as I appreciate the Cyberpunks and No Man's Skies of the world, the passionate devs that won't let a bad release sit, is this really the best we can do anymore, hoping that devs will stick around and fix it? There's basically no incentive for most studios to fix their incomplete games apart from pride and reputation. A special shout out to Nintendo in that we might give them continuous amounts of shit, but they make sure that any of their first party developed titles are released fully completed. Game Freak doesn't count. Bobby Kotick, apart from being known for defending sexual abuse at his companies, was also a major driver for the annual release schedule. Call of Duty, 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 forcing devs to ship samey, incomplete products with little innovation. There's so many imaginative and fun indie games released every year, while the bloated goliaths of the gaming industry constantly plop out tired sequels. The latest innovation is, instead of releasing an incomplete game unintentionally due to overpromising, is to release an incomplete game intentionally in parts. What makes more money than selling one game? Selling one game in multiple releases! Leaks from Sony show they're trying to sell some future games in parts, except that this episodic format doesn't include a price drop. You're expected to pay full box price multiple times to get a complete story. I don't mind a game having some things to pay for after the fact. Studios have costs to maintain servers, keep staff, supply development for the next game, all that and more. It's not about taking a million dollars from a billionaire. It's about taking that last piece of cookie from a man who has nothing else. After all, someone's got to keep League of Legends free for the rest of us. I can somewhat forgive $200 skins in Counter-Strike, Valorant, or TFT, but so many companies will do that AND sell you an incomplete product. China just announced some tentative laws banning certain predatory practices in gaming such as login rewards, consecutive purchase rewards, and rewards for spending money for the first time. And honestly, I don't find myself disagreeing with these and some of their other stances on microtransactions. Gaming companies have figured out how to game our brains to maximize profits, and I'd be interested to see what the US or EU come up with for similar laws pushing back a little. 
Epic Games got sued for a quarter billion dollars for similar dark patterns, and I expect it won't be the last lawsuit we hear of. Anyways, to me, if a company is trying to be more ethical and avoid some of what was mentioned in this video, a more permanent solution would be trying to follow in indie gaming's footsteps. Stop trying to make your games bigger and more convoluted. Baldur's Gate 3, GTA 5, they're fantastic games, but if they don't immediately blow up, the company might just go out of business after one bad release. Focus on gameplay. Having hundreds of developers and artists detailing how Geralt's luscious hair interacts with his right nipple isn't something that makes or breaks a game. Look, I have no idea what you want from me. To most people, anyways. The gameplay and story are what people will remember. I don't really know where this will all end up. It feels like we were spoiled growing up with passionate developers who released tons of great games with the industry growing in a healthy, sustainable way. The layoffs hitting the industry recently are largely because gaming budgets are sky high, costing hundreds of millions for many big name releases. There needs to be more of a push for gameplay over graphics. Companies wouldn't need to spend nearly so much if they lower their ambitions a bit. Games like Prince of Persia, The Lost Crown are perhaps a step in the right direction, with a big studio like Ubisoft focusing on a side-scroller metroidvania type game rather than a bloated open world one that costs several times as much to produce. Without preying on gambling addicted whales, these companies couldn't even make most of these games. Well, no matter what happens, if gaming has another crash like it did in 1983, or if it continues having more success, it doesn't matter. Because Bobby Kotick is gone. And it's a good day. If you've gotten to this point, we'd super appreciate it if you throw us a like or a sub. It goes a long way. Shoot us a comment of some of the worst examples of monetization you've seen or the best example, a monetization method that you thought was pretty neat. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.